Good afternoon. This is the Thurston County Board of Health for Tuesday, May 9th, 2017. I'm Commissioner Bud Blake, the chair of the board this year. I'd like to start off first by doing introductions. Off to my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards. To my right is John Hutchings, Commissioner John Hutchings. To his right is Lydia Hoskinson, the clerk of the board. And to her right is the Director of Public Health and Social Services, Shelley Slaughter. And to her right is the County Manager, Ramiro Chavez. And so with that in mind, I'll call the meeting to order. And one of the first items we have on our agenda today is a couple of proclamations, which are super exciting to let the public know where we're at as far as public health in general. And so, oh, we better do that. You're absolutely right. Thank you. That's why I got a vice chair. We need to make a motion <laughs> to approve the agenda. How about that? Mr. Chair, I move to approve <laughs> today's agenda. I'll second that. It's been moved and second to approve today's agenda for May 9th, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So now we move into the proclamations. And so with that in mind, we have the um, proclamation for Nurses Week in Thurston County. I think either Rachel Wood or Gretchen Thaler or who's doing this one? Is this a particular? Okay, sure. Shelly could do it. like to ask the Thurston County Board of Health to proclaim May 6th through 12th as Nurses Week in Thurston County. Since 1991, National Nurses Week is celebrated annually from May 6th, National Nurses Day through May 12th, Florence Nightingale's birthday. The Thurston County Board of Health shall proclaim May 6th through 12th as Nurses Week in Thurston County and call upon all citizens, communities, state agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders, and businesses to celebrate nurse, nursing's accomplishments and efforts to improve our healthcare system and show our appreciation for the nations and our community's nurses, not just during this week, but rather to join us in honoring many nurses who care for us all at every opportunity throughout the year. So please take a moment to thank our very own community health nurses for the work that they do for people in our community. And if the nurses in the audience could please stand up. And I would just like to recognize some of our nurses that work at Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. Amy Longmeyer, Apple Martine, Bonnie Peterson, Kathy Sherman, Deb Ward, Gretchen Toller, Lindsay Sund, Lori Montoya, Marianne Remy, Sandy Cooper, and Sonia Nakasone. So on behalf of all of our nurses, Gretchen Thaler will be accepting the proclamation at today's Board of Health meeting. Are they gonna come up? Time to get up here, are, are you folks coming up for a photo? Yeah, I've been She's got it accepted. Okay, we'll do it now. <laughs> well, Dr. Wood just got here, so I ought to get her involved in it. Huh? I feel better already. I'm the oldest guy here, and I feel like I'm going to live a lot longer already. <laughs> <laughs> I have bosses everywhere. <laughs> I can't escape. Okay, we'll let the vice chair read the proclamation now. Whereas, since 1991, National Nurses Week is celebrated annually from May 6th, National Nurses Day, through May 12th, Florence Nightingale's birthday. And whereas nearly 84,000 registered nurses, licensed practic practical nurses, and advanced registered nurse practitioners including staff nurses, nurse educators, nurse practitioners, school nurses, public health nurses, long-term care nurses, nurse managers, and nurses in many other practice areas work in Washington State. And whereas nurses are public health heroes who make our community safer and healthier and contribute to our community as community advocates, educators, and providers of critical health services, and Whereas nurses provide a, time, a timeless commitment to our community 365 days a year, 
and touch many vulnerable individuals and their families with caring and competent presence. And whereas nurses represent the front line in most health systems, including public health, and whereas nurses' contributions uh, are considered crucial to the delivery of effective, high-quality care with positive, lasting outcomes, and whereas the American and Washington Nurses Association have declared the week of May 6th through the 12th, 2017, as National Nurses Week, Year of the Healthy Nurse. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Thurston County Board of Health proclaims May 6th through the 12th, 2017, as Nurses Week in Thurston County and calls upon all citizens communities, state agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders, and businesses to celebrate nurses' accomplishments and efforts to improve our health care system and show our appreciation for the nation's and our community's nurses, not just during this week, but rather to join us in honoring the many nurses who care for all of us at every opportunity throughout the year. Adopted this ninth day of May 2017, signed by the Board of Health Commissioners. I just want to say thank you very much because uh, you are our lifeline when it comes right down to it. Thank you. In public health, just do so many different things and encounter so many different experiences every single day, and they they're very hardworking and passionate about what they do, and we thank you for recognizing us. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, just just last evening, <laughs> come back. <laughs> just last uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, uh, our daughter-in-law with two of our grandkids in the car, they were rear-ended in Lacey, and so they were taken to the hospital, and nurses tended them. And our little uh, uh, our niece, who's uh, six, was saying how much she loved the nurses. They made her feel better. Oh, good. So good. I, that's important. Yeah, it, you never know when you're going to be running into a different situation and um, so I mean even our nurse Lindsay a few weeks ago just on her day off was driving through town and ended up pulling over to do CPR on someone that had overdosed and uh. so just um, just you know you never know and it and we're glad that she was there and that she could help out so you guys are you guys are blessings wait Thank wait you. there's more Sorry. you know I, I I just want to point out that uh, our sheriff had a uh, accident like, last year, oh my gosh. and there was an off-duty nurse that came by, and he would not be with us today if it hadn't have been for the dedication. That nurse didn't have to stop. She, she was not uh, obligated in any way, shape, or form. She stopped and saved his life. Yep. No two ways about it, saved his life. So it's just one good example of all that you folks do on a regular basis, and you never get appreciated really enough. Thank you very much. That nurse Thank you. Took care of him on the ground, and started all, the scene, all bringing the, in the medevac, and yeah. everything, lining it up. And this is why we have uh, Sheriff Snazer with us today. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Uh, I'd like to say, on top of that, um, Lifeline is just a kind of an understatement. Um, and when one's world is kind of turned upside down with Sheriff Snazer or just a little sniffle, nurses bring the love and care back to wholesome and bring you back to life in terms of the, the leadership and care that goes into being di dignity. What? I got to say to one okay. more. Okay. <laughs> I can't stand it. Well, because they are so important. Right. And, and for Hutch and I, okay. in the careers that we were involved in in law enforcement, well, we've got well over 50 years between us. And your military experience. Thank you. That's you where know, I was trying to go. Combat. I mean, it's just, I think we have a maybe a deeper appreciation than the yeah. average citizen. It's yeah. just unbelievable I have seen the accomplishments the that you folks are directly involved in and the lives you've saved. I know doctors do great, wonderful things, but I'm telling you, you are that first line and it's just unbelievable how important the positions you hold are. Thank you. Kathy Sherman, that's you too. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we'll leave it there. We have another proclamation. Thank you, yeah, thank you Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, next proclamation is Health Awareness Month and are you reading this one too, Shelley? Uh, Commissioner Hutchins is going to read it, oh, but I'm going to introduce go. like um, <laughs> introduce okay. our speaker who is accepting the proclamation. Oh, sure. 
So I request the Board of Health proclaim May 2017 Mental Health Awareness Month to increase the public understanding of the importance of mental health and promote the identification and treatment of mental illness and substance use disorders. Today, we have with us Marilyn Roberts, President of the National Alliance on Mental Health to accept the board's proclamation on behalf of the thousands of Thurston County residents who are impacted by mental illness every day in our community. And we don't have Marilyn here today. She's over uh, attending another function in the courthouse. But we have Jamie. Jamie. I was just going to say Jamie. Okay, good. Okay, sure. Here Sorry, Jamie. Thank you for being here to accept that Absolutely. proclamation on NAMI's behalf. Whereas mental health is part of overall health, and whereas one in five adults experiences a mental health problem in any given year, and one in 17 adults live with mental illness. I have allergies, hang on. Uh, one in five adults live with mental illness such as major depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. And whereas approximately one half of chronic mental health or mental illness begins at the age of 14 and three quarters by age 24. And whereas long delays, sometimes decades, often occur between the time symptoms first appear and when individuals get help and whereas early identification and treatment can make a difference in successful management of mental illness and recovery, and whereas it is important to maintain mental health and learn the symptoms of mental illness in order to get help when it is needed, and whereas every citizen and community can make a difference in helping end the silence and stigma that far too long has surrounded mental illness and discouraged people from getting help, and whereas public education and civic activities can encourage mental health and help improve the lives of individuals and families affected by mental illness. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Health hereby proclaims May as Mental Health Awareness Month to increase public understanding of the importance of mental health and to promote identification and treatment of mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Adopted this ninth day of May, 2017, Signed by the Board of Health Commissioners. Come on up. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, um, my name, for the record, my name is Jamie Lifka. I am the Vice President of the Thurston Mason Affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I am so pleased to accept your proclamation and thank you for joining with us in our commitment to decrease the stigma associated with mental health conditions, to increase public understanding of the importance of mental health, and to promote access to quality care so that the one in five of us that live with a mental health condition can embrace hope and strive for recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Do you have a quick comment? Yeah, well, Jamie. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do very much. It uh, kind of boils back down to Hutch and I from another life. Uh, if you think about what goes on, and I've been aggravated since the 80s when funding for mental health was cut back tremendously, and what that did was dump a lot of responsibilities onto local government that was not able to adequately deal with that. County jails are a prime example of the inefficiencies of proper mental health treatment. Uh, Commissioner Blake has really made some strides in that regard. I think that'll be commented on a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But uh, we really need to pay attention to mental health. Uh, I'm going to say half of the jail population in some needs in, in one way or another are directly affected by mental health. It drives up costs to the community because they are not properly handled. And uh, the more we can do to deal with mental health, it's, it's just a big issue. Kind of goes right back with the nurses and their recognition. And uh, we it's just a, a tough one for society to deal with, but we need to invest. Thank you very much for all you do. Hutch has a I do, and uh, I've been working with, uh, with NAMI for the last 16 years uh, in training police officers and criminal justice folks um, in the signs and symptoms of mental illness and de-escalation. So I've worked closely with NAMI Thurston Mason, even since we, way back when, when Bill Pilkey was the president, 
and now Marilyn Roberts is, and she's a, she's a great advocate. And you, Jamie, are a great uh, advocate when you come in and do your in our own voice uh, for the police officers. It's powerful, and they've told me how powerful it is. And so I love this shirt, and I wear it often when I'm not working, <laughs> and I'm wearing a tie about breaking the stigma. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a huge supporter of mental health uh, court. So Thurston, Mason, uh, Nami, thank you very kindly. Thank you very much for all the work you do. Hey, thank you. And just one tiny question for me. Uh, give us an idea how big Nami is or Nami is here in Thurston, Mason, and how many people and some of the things you do there. Some of the things we do. So mm -hmm. um, we, do, we, we offer support groups for people um, four times a month for people living with mental illness. One of the important things about our organization is we recognize the importance of support of family members. Mm -hmm. And so we have peer programs and we have family programs that, that parallel them. So we have um, support groups for family members as well as people living with a mental illness. Um, we do um, mental health education classes, 10 to 12 week classes. Um, we do in what, what um, Commissioner Hutchings was just saying was that, you know, we do in our, what a program called In Our Own Voice where we go out to the community. Um, over the last three years, we have spoken to more than 3,000 people, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we have heard from the places that where we present that uh, in the inpatient settings, so we, we've been, we've been um, doing the In Our Own Voice presentation at St. Peter's for about four, four or five years. We just started doing those presentations at the Triage Center and at the yeah. ETU and, and, and their step-down program. Um, the one thing that I want to say is that um, the feedback that we have gotten from doing those presentations is that um, people go in, into the group um, proce processing rooms um, and, and um, before we did our presentations, they would go in there thinking about how their life is so bad and they're hopeless. And, and there's nothing that they, that that can do that they can do except for thinking about suicide, and it has changed since we started doing our presentations. And nurses there, the staff there, say that people go into those those group meetings thinking maybe maybe hope is is possible for me, and maybe hope recovery is possible for me. So that's that's the biggest um, part that I'm gonna, that I'd like to express about um, our programs. So we we have presented to over 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, Hundreds and hundreds of people, community members. So for NAMI and Thurston Mason together, how many people are uh, kind of employed and how many volunteers? Kind of the, tell us the scope of the size of Okay, so right now we have mm -hmm. um, one actual staff member who is an office coordinator mm -hmm. and um, volunteer coordinator. We have a board that um, we're just going to be voting on on our annual meeting in a couple of weeks. Cool. Um, we have, on, on our board, we have, we tried to be as diverse as possible because the, I mean, the issue is, is affects everybody out there, right? Yeah, sure. So we have mental health providers, we have, t we, we, we are going to add a teacher on, we have a law and justice um, person on there. We used to have an attorney from the Office of, office of Assigned Counsel. We have a um, uh, police officer, an Evergreen police officer now on our board. We have a military person on our board. We have family members, we have peers. We try to do everything, you know, have all of that together. Um, we have probably 40 different volunteers that go out there every single day. And if I showed you my calendar for the month of May, mm. you know, we have 18 different presentations and peer groups going on and support groups going on and every day is covered basically. See, that's not seen every day, but we know you're out there making that happen. You and your team, your, your, your uh, NAMI. We're growing, we're right. growing a lot. Yeah. And, and we would like to have money at some point to hire an executive <laughs> yeah. director so we can grow yeah, even yeah. further well. and bring our services especially to Mason County. Sure. Thank you for what you do. We're going to be there to help you break the stigma, and we love what NAMI does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> so the next item we have on the agenda is the opportunity for the public to address the board, and I'll just look at the audience. I don't have anybody signed up on my paper um, to come to the board, to the podium and speak. Is there anybody that wishes to take advantage of it now? No. See, okay, we'll move on to the departmental items, which we have a packed list of things to go through today. So first, uh, for number four is the departmental item. We have the Capitol Medical Center, and uh, Gretchen Thaler, and I think she's going to introduce Gail Yandel from the uh, Capitol Medical Center, and they're going to talk about 
Breastfeeding Friendly Washington Hospital Award. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Yep. You got the floor. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to come. My name is Gretchen Toller. I'm the Maternal Child Health Coordinator and the Supervisor of the Nurse Family Partnership. We know that breastfeeding is very beneficial to moms and children, and while it's a natural way to feed babies, adequate breastfeeding support in the community and at home is essential for moms and their families to initiate and maintain breastfeeding. At Thurston County Public Health, we work closely through our NFP program and our Children's Special Health Care Needs programs. We talk to moms and dads early on in their pregnancy and continue that ongoing support. We're seeing a 96% initiation rate for breastfeeding with our NFP moms. Successful breastfeeding in our community is a partnership between many agencies and individuals that touch the lives of families. This includes community partners such as WIC, our hospitals, physicians, public health, the Family Support Center who offers a breastfeeding drop-in group every single week, and many more. Our hospitals see families at a pivotal yet vulnerable point as they become parents. We're so happy that Capital Medical Center is here today to share some information about what they're doing and their award, their Bronze Breastfeeding Friendly Award. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Gail Yandel and Sheila Waterstreet from Capital Medical Center. Thank you for having Hi. us and good mm -hmm. afternoon. I'm Gail Yandel and I'm the Director of Women's Services at Capital Medical Center. Um, as you know, we're a 110 bed hospital and we birth about 800 babies a year. So um, we're a very busy, active unit and we, um, we've had a lactation program now going since 1995 when we started developing it. We've been had a continuous lactation nurse ever since that point. Sheila took over our program about one year ago and she, um, before that she was one of our primary nurses in our labor and delivery unit. And so she achieved her IBCLC and she has taken our program and has really been developing it greatly. And so we're very proud of her and she's gonna talk to you a little bit more about our program. Thank you, thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. um, you bet. Are you familiar at all with the Washington State Breastfeeding Friendly Initiative? Not as no. much as you. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Michelle Lord mm -hmm. is here. She works for the Department of um, Health mm -hmm. at Washington State, and she actually created this as a more accessible program. I'm, you might have heard of the Baby Friendly Program, Baby Friendly Hospitals, um, and it's also a ten-step program. But it's um, it's it's there's they have pretty diligent requirements. It's it's pretty um, difficult to achieve some of those for some of the some of the smaller hospitals. So Washington State came along and said, we want to help our hospitals here. Um, we, um, we know moms in Washington want to breastfeed. We have one of the highest initiation rates in the whole country. Um, and so this program just kind of gives you 10 steps from s just having a policy, being able to implement it, educating your staff, skin to skin right away, um, try not to introduce any artificial nipples or formula if it's not needed, um, and most importantly, being able to educate your patients and sending them out with some community resources. And um, we have such great public health nurses in this area and WIC, and we have these resources out there. A lot of moms just don't know about them. Um, so Capital Medical Center, um, we have a pretty high IMPINC score from the CDC as far as breastfeeding success. Uh, what um, kind of score? I didn't hear. It's called IMPINC score from the CDC. They kind of look at different factors as far as basically breastfeeding success okay, for their new moms. Sure. Um, and, uh, and we're one of the first hospitals in the county to kind of jump on this um, Washington State program and and try to get certified as Washington State breastfeeding friendly. So we're at the bronze level um, And honestly, I truly believe a lot of these hospitals are doing a lot of this um, They just um, it's just a matter of getting recognized and documenting documenting it um, So we want to support moms and, and and their breastfeeding goals and we know that in, that initiation is key to success um, And so when I first started ten years ago like most hospitals we would baby would be born and we'd whisk away to the warmer and weigh it, measure it, do all that we need to do, swaddle up, hand it around the family, and by the time it got back to mom, it was <laughs> sleepy and not so interested in eating. So um, breastfeeding research, we're learning more and more every day, and basically it all comes to moms belong on baby. Um, and we have seen a drastic difference in um, 
baby's success, breastfeeding success, babies not being in the nursery for being too cold or their low blood sugars, more confidence in moms and, and um, dads and families with breastfeeding. Um, you know, initially when we started the skin to skin right away and not messing with baby if baby was stable, um, there was some some grumbling about the family really wanted to hold baby right away or mm -hmm. you know the nurses doctors wanted to get their measurements done um, but now we're seeing such a difference we see we see grandma come in and be like yeah colostrum that's good for the baby you do that or um, dad being like yeah we're definitely going to do skin to skin so this has been a great resource for us um, we keep baby with mom we give them all the support they need um, and this program has given us the tools to do that so um, we send home, moms home with that knowledge and resource they need. Um, we are available for lactation follow-up, whether baby's two days old, four weeks old, a year old. They can always call or come in for help. Yeah. And uh, we're seeing a lot more um, uh, opportunities in the community, too, for breastfeeding success. So okay. um, we're really grateful that we've, um, we have this opportunity to take advantage of it. And we know that breastfeeding and breast milk makes a big difference in long-term health and community and financial um, financially with our health um, system so we're hoping that okay. we see differences in that as well let's keep to the grocery store yeah. huh yeah. dr wood a peer educators um it, within the hospital yeah. you mean um right now it's just a matter of all of our labor and delivery and postpartum staff are all educated on breastfeeding um i know um WIC it, if we can get moms linked with maternity support services or WIC, there are a lot of great um, breastfeeding counselors, but also just the drop-in group, family support center drop-in group. Um, and there are some also just some great moms groups in the area that we encourage moms, because yeah, they're the, some of the best resources, just sharing your stories with different moms and helping each other out that way. And social media, there's ah. so many breastfeeding groups on social media yeah, too that are a great resource. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I take an opportunity to brag a little bit? Yep, go ahead. Um, you never stopped to before. <laughs> <laughs> well, no uh, bottle feeding. No bottle feeding, no. <laughs> We're not doing that here. I, uh, I would like to brag a little bit that uh, my kids, my grandkids, were all breastfed. And I know that's a big issue, especially for working mothers that mm -hmm. have to struggle that balance between making it all work and doing the right thing. and. I can only say that I would hope that with us helping you that we'll be at the platinum level <laughs> shortly. But I'm, yeah. I'm very glad that you were recognized because I think it is so important in those early stages of life that uh, these kids get off to a, a good start. I mean, you've heard me before say kids are 30% of our population and 100% of our future. And that 100% benefit really only starts if we look at prenatal care on. And breastfeeding is a big portion of that. And uh, thank you for all you do. And I wish you all the success in the world. And hopefully you're going to be here uh, in a year or two. And we're going to be talking about that platinum level. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very thank you. much. Thank you very much. We got more? Yes, I'm number seven of nine kids. <laughs> <laughs> And my mom is 99 and still very lucid and with it today, going on about 75. So I think she was getting pretty done by the time I come around. <laughs> and there, there was two others after me. Um, but it turned out okay. But then it was different when our kids were born 36 and 34 years ago. And it was really coming on the, the cusp of that, so to speak. But now our grandkids are born. And we're all excited, my wife and I, about seeing the grandbabies. Nope, it's skin time. <laughs> what? What's this? And so it's so vital and so important. And we respect that and love it. Okay. So in order to have you in the, in, in the county say one of the, uh, one of the first hospitals, we only have two, don't we, in the county? Within Olympia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're the first <laughs> uh, to be bronze level. That's beautiful. I'm exceptionally proud, exceptionally proud. Uh, I'm proud of the work that you're doing with... Um, with young moms and, and babies. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. thank you very much. Sure, I gotta jump in there too. My yeah. <laughs> three daughters and my granddaughter are breastfed and through the family, so we promote it and support it too. Um, and the other thing, oh, uh, could you made uh, words to uh, more opportunities in the community. Uh, can you kind of give me a, I'm a numbers guy. Can you yeah. kind of give us a feedback? Is there a better mood and numbers of 
yes. um, breastfeeding going on versus formula. Not to be anti-formula or anything like that, but just is there mm -hmm. a better, is it, is it moving in the better yeah, direction? Yeah, we're of looking at our numbers and more and more moms are coming in wanting to breastfeed. Um, mm -hmm. They are more educated about the setbacks, so they're prepared for those. Um, and there's more, just as far as the community resources, there are more private practice IBCLCs out there available for moms. There's, again, more of the moms groups there to support each other. I'm seeing such a difference with um, uh, patients and families already coming in educated about the benefits of breastfeeding and knowing what they want and already knowing about some of the resources. So it, it, there's a big difference I've noticed just in, in within 10 years, but definitely within the last 20 years. Good. Much healthier babies, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, uh -huh. and then I'm not sure, but I'm going to look at Shelly and anybody else that's been out there as far as the health director. Uh, I know certain places in the county we have where uh, women can do the best breed, but I think there needs to be a larger, better discussion in how we do that here in the county and other places also outside the county organization of how um, breastfeeding is just totally part of the norm and mm -hmm. going about doing it. We would support something like that. So, yeah. And I think Dr. Woods got another. You mentioned I IBCLC. Could you just define that because yes, I, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah. So uh, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. Um, oh, wow. It's there. There are there's breastfeeding counselors. There's certified lactation counselors. Um, there's different terms, but IBCLC is kind of the international. Say it slower. Um, IBCLC, okay, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. So sure. It's a pretty it's a pretty grueling test you do and around the world, obviously international, and we're working actually to, towards getting um, licensure so that we can be recognized and reimbursed and moms can get more access to, to care, um, lactation care for themselves. So yeah, you'll see more of us popping up around the area. There's already quite a few of us, so. And he still has one more thing to say. Now, if you want my mom to come up and present or be a role <laughs> yeah. model, yeah. I'm sure she'd love it. Moms, moms helping moms, that's the key, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Thank sure you. I'm glad you came today. Yeah. For, I didn't know we could talk so much about breastfeeding today, but we can do it. Yes. Oh, I can talk. <laughs> yeah, we can go on and on and on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. But we got to move on. And so the next department item is, uh, I think Chris Hawkins is going to come up, introduce Aaron Riffey from in Stacy Mueller from ESD 113 about youth marijuana prevention form that's going to happen here shortly. You got it. Go ahead, Chris. Great. Uh, so I will just turn things over to our partners at Educational Service District 113, Aaron Riff and Stacy Mueller, and they'll give you a little bit of introdu introduction to an upcoming forum on marijuana and then one that follows that on tobacco and vaping among young oh, people. Oh, let's do it. Bring them up. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see we you. We appreciate being here mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about our programs. I'm Erin Reif. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health and okay. Student Support at ESD 113. Um, I manage our behavioral health program. We're one of um, nine ESDs in the state and the only one currently licensed to provide comprehensive behavioral health in schools. So we provide a multi-tiered system of support in schools. So we provide prevention all the way through recovery supports. So prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery supports. Um, and part of the pieces of that that we feel is important is to provide education opportunities. And so we partner with lots of different people to put on um, forums and those types of things to keep our school staff and our community partners educated on the questions that they, they ask us. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce um, Stacy Mueller, who is our clinical supervisor, <laughs> um, who is <laughs> who's going to talk a little bit about the upcoming forum yeah. and introduce that. All right. Well, thanks for inviting Bring us here. Mic down just a tad. There you go. Are you saying I'm short? Okay. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we want to hear you. It's, it speaks right into the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would never I say that. I just feel so honored to be here today sure. because of um, all of the things that we're talking about uh, in regards to youth. Uh, the, the proclamations for the nurses and for it being Mental Health Month um, is fantastic, as well as breastfeeding, because I work with adolescents every day, and so all of those things um, are, are really obvious and evident when they get to be in my care, um, some of the things um, they miss out on, so I'm happy to see that we're promoting those things. Um, like Aaron said, my name is Stacy Mueller, and I'm clinical supervisor, and I, also, I work in uh, Lewis County. And um, the, uh, I'm a little nervous. That's so, all right, we got you, uh, you go ahead. I just wanna say that the purpose of our forum is to provide uh, prevention leaders in our regions with the most up-to-date information regarding marijuana. So 
One thing that I have recognized in my work over the past uh, year and a half with the Youth Marijuana Education and Prevention Program is that there isn't enough information out there. And I myself went looking for information and uh, discovered that we're still really lacking in that area. And so I believe that if I couldn't find information that there were others, not just in the prevention field, but just in the general public that are looking for information. And um, with that, uh, I started looking for trainings, hoping that I could find something, and there really wasn't anything, especially in Washington State. Some of the other states that have had legalization come into effect have um, been able to put together some forums and information sessions, and so um, with Aaron and Matt's help, we decided that it was a great time to get that started and provide the education for people in our community because we all love Washington State and we wanna make it a healthy and happy place for youth and families and everyone in our community. Um, I also wanna say that um, the goal of our forum is um, to prevent use, to stop initiation of use, mm -hmm. and also end continued use by youth. And that's very important because there's so many mixed messages out there right now in regards to marijuana that a lot of times the adults and youth's lives don't have the correct information. And so uh, we've made it really one of our goals to get that information out there. And with that, I'm gonna introduce Matt Shellhart, and he's been a great partner with Choice Regional Network, and he's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about the forum and give you some important information about that. You bet. Thank you. Come on up, Matt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Oh, here we go. There, there we go. are. Perfect. Um, so again, my name is Matthew Shellhart, Youth Marijuana Prevention and Education Program Manager. I know it's a mouthful. Couldn't figure a way to shorten it. So. Uh, we're with you. <laughs> um, so on behalf of Choice Regional Health Network and then the program that I represent, thank you for this opportunity again and then in collaboration with ESC 113. Um, so as Stacy mentioned, we... We are putting on a, a forum on May 24th, and it's an all-day forum that just solely focuses on uh, youth prevention and marijuana usage within youth. The best way to really describe it is, you know, we're brainstorming, we're thinking about it, and this forum is going to cover uh, data sharing. My program covers a seven-county region, um, and for those that you guys may not know, Cowlitz County, Grace Harbor, Lewis, Mason, Pacific, Thurston, and Waukiacum County. So that seven county region is a big region. And so to be able to pull in people that represent um, uh, mental health, medical field, data sharing, and traffic safety, I mean, those kind of cover all your elements in, that you could really think of in regards to marijuana. And so we've got some tremendous people and uh, speakers, Jason Kilmer, uh, UW associate professor, um, Jennifer Golick out of California. She's a clinical director um, at Mirrorwood. And then we have our own Todd Johnson, Dr. Todd Johnson from ESD 113. And then from a toxology laboratory manager with the Washington State Patrol, Dr. Brianna Peterson. And then we also have Washington Poison Center giving us a lovely presentation because we know that um, one of the issues that we're facing is an uprise in edible consumption mm -hmm. among youth. Um, and when I say youth, I'm talking in terms of five and under is, oh is a, a relatively big focus um, with some of the problems. And so uh, having just a sole one day packed of full information and then looking at regional data so that we can update not only um, decision makers and leaders within each county, but also coalition members, um, law enforcement, anyone that deals with um, marijuana and, and subject with youth and prevention, uh, we encourage to come. So we're looking and hoping to fill 200 seats. So, so encourage to come. Kind of back us up and pull us through a date, time, place, how, oh, they, yeah, get in, sorry. how they get involved and yeah. you know, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so May 24th, mm -hmm. um, and it'll be all day. So we'll start the speaking at 8.30, but we're um, also saying, you know, from 8 to 5, essentially, from an 8.30 to 4.30 type deal at the Great Wolf Lodge. And registration can be s found at the ESD 113 mm -hmm. um, class website, which, yeah. did I direct them right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, type and a search word marijuana and it'll pop right up. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll pop right up. <laughs> uh, Great Wolf Lodge located in Rochester, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay, sure. We don't want to go to a different one, but gotcha. Yeah. Um, anything else, uh, Aaron uh, or Stacy? I think I covered, Stacey? you guys have anything else to add? Yeah. Uh, you want to add anything? Sure. Well, I have one one question. Uh, <coughs> earlier, you said that uh, 
it was mentioned that maybe we weren't ahead of the curve here when we legalized marijuana. Did I, is that what I heard? We're, we don't have uh, quite the prevention and education component into what we've done here locally in the state of Washington that some of the other jurisdictions did? Is that, are we missing the boat somewhere on, on intervention and, and early education on marijuana? Prevention. Yeah, prevention and such. I, I know we've been talking as a health board about trying to uh, develop some resources to infuse uh, re revenue basically into mm -hmm. this issue, but uh, did other states get ahead of us in this regard? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I, what I noticed was looking for training for professionals uh -huh. is I couldn't find anything in Washington State. And so, you know, it might have been the time of year that I was looking. And then when I looked in Colorado, there were more training opportunities. And so I can't really speak to what other states are doing or not doing. But I can also talk about my own personal experience with uh, working with parents and um, with law enforcement and the court system in Lewis County is there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of um, people that are uninformed, not because they want to be, just because it's really hard to find really evidence-based information. And so, yes, I do think that we could do better with that. I really do. Uh, could I comment one more thing, Mr. Chair? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would ask that possibly you keep us informed as the Board of Health here for Thurston County on things that you come across that you feel would be beneficial in helping us work with you, basically, to do the great job that you do. And uh, I know we're struggling with regulation right now on the marijuana growing and selling and all that. We're dealing with it, but uh, we would like to have a component in there to help us fund early intervention and education with youth. So anything you can come up with to give us advice, if you could funnel it through the system or Give us a call direct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for all you do. A little Thank bit you. more. I appreciate that. So that's going to be a, uh, an excellent uh, symposium or conference that day on the 24th at the Great Wolf Lodge. But what I value uh, is what you've already said right up front is that you're, you're, um, it sounds like your emphasis is on prevention and education, but then intervention as well. And uh, protecting our kids from uh, accidental or intentional ingestion uh, is, is paramount to me. So thank you very much for what you're doing. Love ESD 113. Yeah, I love to triple that and you have this board support as far as what you're doing and getting way out in front for prevention and be the stopping the dis initiation or the continuation of it. We love that idea. Love choice. Love ESD 113 and uh, can't wait till the 24th of May to see what's going on. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. We thank appreciate you. it. You bet. I hope you all join us. I'll be there. So um, Chris <laughs> has elected me to talk about something else. Okay, good. <laughs> sure. One of the other things that uh, Educational Service District 113 is doing is a, is a lot of tobacco uh, oh, education yeah. and outreach in our community. And this, too, is a, has a substantial health impact in our community and, again, is one of these areas where if we do the early work of prevention education, uh, preventing that youth initiation, it goes a long way to reducing the smoking rate in our adult population here in Thurston County, um, which is something we're definitely concerned about at the health department. And so there's been a, uh, a forum that ES Educational Services 113 is, is supporting our department to put on the following week after that marijuana forum. So exactly one week after that on May 31st from 10 to 1 at the health department building, we're doing a similar forum of bringing together policymakers, uh, school leaders, and other stakeholders in the effort to educate the community about vaping. And, and its association with tobacco use and, and other uh, substance use. Yeah. So what, what time is that one, Chris? That's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Thurston County Public Health and, and Social Services. On 31 March, or March 31st. March sorry. 31st. May. Like May. Or May, sorry. May. <laughs> Don't go in March. Ah. Yeah. Calendar's full. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anything else? I'd just like to thank Chris for his dedication. Yep. I mean, you, you exemplified dedication. I just want to thank you. Yeah. yeah. Ditto. Okay. With that in mind, we have the next departmental item, which is the Thurston Thrives Update Community Care Center. We have maybe Chris going to introduce Liz and TJ LaRock as far as the uh, manager at the Community Care Center downtown. 
Liz can do her, her introduction <laughs> quite well of TJ. Uh, Liz is the community coordinator for Thurston Thrives and yeah. uh, here to introduce this sure. next item. Thank you. I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, the man who does it all, even I know. technology. Intros to bicycling <laughs> to vaping. As Chris <laughs> mentioned, I'm Liz Davis. I am the community coordinator for Thurston Thrives, and I also have the pleasure of being the um, advisory council co-chair of the Community Care Center, along with Dr. Joseph Pellissier. And this topic is especially appropriate given that this is both um, Nurses Week and also Mental Health Month because our next presenter is both um, a nurse and a mental health professional. So it all fits together very well. The Community Care Center, um, is a fantastic example of collaboration among all sorts of different partners who are a part of Thurston Thrives, including the clinical care action team as pertains to both mental health and substance abuse, public safety and justice, housing, and more. And before I turn the mic over to TJ, I would also be remiss if I didn't make another couple of connections between um, things going on this month and Thurston Thrives. And one is to point out the connection between mental illness and adverse childhood experiences. I know um, the board has heard previously about the effect that adverse childhood experiences can have and the importance of prevention. Research tells us that up to 78% of serious and persistent mental illness may be preventable by reducing adverse childhood experiences. And our very own Nurse Family Partnership has some of the absolute best outcomes um, in the world as pertains to prevention of ACEs. So I wanted to point that out as well. So I will turn it over to TJ to talk about the Providence Community Care Center. Hey, come on up TJ, how you doing there? Hello, TJ. Hello. Thank you, commissioners. Um, first off, yeah, I would like to thank you for both the proclamations earlier. Um, one is as a psychiatric nurse, and two, I'm also on the board of NAMI, so yeah. um, I appreciate both of them. Thank you, you guys. Bet. For Two for for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm here to talk to you about the community care center. I'm not going to stick to this um, slideshow because I'm going to try and make it a little faster. Okay, but, good. Um, Basically, what happened a almost three years ago was um, the Providence St. Peter's Foundation Board came to me, and at the time, I was working as the inpatient psychiatric uh, manager for our inpatient psych unit, as well as a crisis services in the emergency department, and for a portion of that, the sexual assault clinic as well, um, and said that they really wanted to, to commit some uh, a large amount of money to doing something for uh, for mental health services. And they were pre particularly wanting to target um, the people that they see that, that are often homeless, that have substance use issues, um, and that um, also, you know, have mental health issues, um, particularly in our downtown core area, and wanted to, to address that population. So uh, I spent um, the next six months after that basically talking to everyone that I could in the community that provides uh, services to that population or has any kind of interaction with them. Um, to kind of find out what were the challenges with serving this particular population. And three main things um, came up. The first was that it can take in our community uh, between a month and two months to get in to see uh, a prescriber for psychiatric medications. Um, the second was that housing services and mental health and healthcare services were delivered and coordinated on completely different pathways uh, and were not delivered connected, uh, you know, together. And so that was challenging because if you try to provide the support services like mental health services to someone who's unhoused, the efficacy of those services just falls off a cliff. And if you try to house someone who doesn't have all the right support services in place, it can be very challenging because that person will often encounter some of the same struggles and not be able to stay in that housing placement. So what came from that was um, a pretty large uh, cooperative effort amongst lots of organizations to try to co-locate uh, in one location where we could um, basically act as an entry point to a lot of different service lines, um, in particularly housing and mental health um, and substance use. Uh, and so um, that, that is basically what, what has um, been going on for the last three years is getting this project going. And I'm proud to say that um, as of a few weeks ago, we are under construction, construction is underway. Uh, and we hope to be open by um, late summer. So um, what we are basically going to be doing, um, 
sorry, I'm going through this. Um, we have lots of partners, not all of which are on this particular slide, um, but we do have quite a few. Um, our major funding sources were a CDBG grant from the Olympia, um, from the City of Olympia. Um, Capital Medical Center um, gave us a very um, generous donation, and then our Providence Foundation. But what we're going to do is have uh, service providers um, providing mental health services like BH BHR, Capital Recovery Center, CMAR, and Providence. Um, we'll all be providing mental health services. We will have a uh, nurse practitioner who will do bridge medication management so someone can walk in and actually get access to a medical uh, prescriber for mental health uh, issues. We also have um, Sidewalk will be moving all of their coordinated entry services for uh, the adult population into that um, facility. And we'll also have Interfaith Works, um, who runs uh, a lot of the, you know, one of, one of the larger shelters in our community, um, doing uh, kind of the, all the day services and then providing navigation services for the population. Um, hey, TJ. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, go back, oh, yeah. if you don't mind. Some, some uh, of the partners aren't mentioned on this slide. Which ones are missing? Um, well, so this slide's a little bit older, but uh, a couple of them, which they may or may well, one of them is kind of on there, but so first off, we have the Olympia Free Clinic will also be providing their services there, and CMAR will be providing services there. Um, CYS uh, will be doing outreach work there so that they're really targeting the population that they serve to make sure that if they're entering into our system, we don't have the wrong you know, door in the wrong entryway. So mm -hmm. um, they'll be providing services there as well as, um, it says DSHS on there, but specifically Home and Community Services, which is a part of DSHS, will be um, working uh, out of that facility as well. Uh, they, they provide entry into adult family homes uh, and then coordinate this, the care services in those. I currently will be, man moving forward, I'm managing the community care center, but I also manage our, our um, case management services and our in-home care, which provides the support services for, um, for those adult family homes. So we have a connection there to try and get people housed as well. I'd like to give them, give them proper mention if, if they didn't yes, make it up there. Is Thurston absolutely. County involved in that at all? Is what's said? Thurston County involved um, at all? Well, one of our major funders, which is on our newest slide and is not on this one, which um, I do need to get that updated, but I think I gave this to Liz for a previous presentation, <laughs> and um, so, but is the BHO, our Behavioral Health Organization, funds, uh, and so that's our biggest Thurston County, um, you know, support piece, oh, um, funds okay. all of the behavioral <laughs> health um, Thank pieces. Thank you. And then also some of the other um, interfaith and sidewalk, for example, get funding also from, from county sources. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, one of the reasons why I probably didn't mention that right up front is most of the services that are being provided at the Community Care Center are not new services. The bulk of them are services that are already being provided in the community somewhere. But what we're trying to do is be more efficient and more effective in the way that we can access care and deliver it. Um, what's really unique about this program is that there's really always been two different types of service agencies for this population, and one is the folks that do outreach and um, and and see people kind of where they're at and help them um, and engage them into services, and they do a really good job of that. And then there's groups of people who do longer-term support services like mental health care, um, but aren't always as good as engaging the, the clients. So bringing all these agencies together in order to engage them and provide the long-term services is kind of our effort. So the next slides are basically looking at what the facility is. Um, this picture is of the old quilting building, and the photo is taken from the, the transit center, which is downtown. So it's, it's definitely a location um, that is you know, well, well positioned for the service we'll provide. We will have um, two exam rooms uh, that are located there, along with six consult rooms. We have three showers, we'll have three showers, um, five new restrooms, but a total of eight, I think, in the building. Um, and we'll have washers and dryers there for folks to use, uh, and Wi-Fi to help them get through systems, or through, you know, into other services and help them um, navigate that piece. Uh, let's see. I want to get to the slides of the pictures. Um, so this might be small from where you guys are sitting, but this is basically the layout of the building, and this is the construction that's going on, um, that's underway today. We also have office space in the upstairs area, but this is the service um, delivery area. Uh, I don't know if anyone have questions about that. Uh, this is what the outdoor space will look like. So we're taking up um, nearly half of our parking lot to make an outdoor <coughs> space that will include a smoking shelter and a pet relief area, along with just an area for people to spend time. Um, but that's to really try to maximize the po positive impact that we can have and minimize the, the negative impact that might happen to you know, occur for neighbors. Um, so we're trying to keep that in mind. And that will be staffed at all times when we're open. Um, and that's a close-up. So I guess at this time, um, 
I would just ask if you guys have questions, and that was a very short version of, very, yeah, <laughs> of yeah, the presentation. Yeah, Comment. What are your hours of operation going to be down there? So um, we will probably, th this is not, we don't have like official, this is exactly the hours, but the idea is that, that most of the services, um, if I go back yeah. to that picture uh, of the building, essentially the half of the building that has the, the service, the services of the exam rooms or the consult space will probably be open normal types of business hours, like a 8 to 4.30 or a 9 to 5 type of thing. Um, the other side of the building, with the, with, which will have a coffee and, and just a place for people to be, showers, laundry, bathrooms, um, will probably be extended hours. So we would try to open earlier in the morning and stay open a little bit later into the evening, but it is just during daytime hours. And then we'll have additional services um, that will sometimes occur in the evenings. So for example, the Olympia Free Clinic does some of their clinic work. We would have that in like one area of the building and that would be open in ex an extended period in the evening. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's... Thank you. Yes. I know that there was a lot of, a tremendous amount of work that went into this. It's well thought out and I applaud you and, uh, and all the, the people who put this thing together. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be wonderful downtown. I don't think it's gonna be the, the boogaboo thing that some people think it might be. Be very helpful. Thank, thank you. you, TJ. Yep. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you, TJ. I, I would just yeah, like to make a comment that um, the Providence, uh, the, the, the community care center was nominated as a health campaign recipient. Oh, good. By the combination of this thing with Mason County Medical Society and the pension fund. Oh, well, that's the first time I've heard that. Well, so thank wonderful. You very much. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Well done. Congratulations, TJ. Yeah. You learned, got, got some. Okay, so the next item we have on our agenda is Mary Ann Arguero. She's the Thurston County Epidemiologist, and um, she's going to throw some numbers at us for the great subject of aging and health here in Thurston County. Yes, and thank you for your time. You bet, Very much, I appreciate it. Today we have hopefully what will be to you an interesting topic. It is to many people, and I get a lot of questions. Um, related to health and aging in Thurston County. So um, this topic is incredibly relevant to this time. Um, when it comes to um, health and aging, healthy aging, we think of a few different things. We want you to live long. You know, length of life is really important from a public health perspective. We talk about life expectancy and dying prematurely all the time. We want you to live long. But we want you to live well for when you're here. We want you to have quality of life. And there's a range of different factors that can Im improve and impact your quality of life. And some of those things I'm going to cover uh, briefly today with you and um, describe a few things that um, uh, are happening in Thurston County just to give you a feel for some of the things we see in the numbers. This particular slide is something I don't always bring to you demographics, but I wanted to show you this and share with you one thing that we know, you may know, not everyone knows is happening in Thurston County. And that is that the um, population of folks 65 plus in Thurston County continues to grow. Oh, good. And grow and grow. It is growing faster than children. Hmm. So when you think about that, I wanted to share with you where we were in 2000, 2010, and 2016. We're about 44,000 residents age 65 plus and where we expect to be and how that's going to continue to grow. And as you know, with the kind of planning and work that you do, with a growing population, there are considerations around services, about mm -hmm. needs, transportation, housing. Um, your capacity to serve is impacted as soon as the numbers increase. And as Thurston County is going and as all the projections show, um, that particular component of our population is going to continue to be sizable and growing. So it's something from a health perspective and a service perspective that we um, uh, would be benefited by keeping in mind. Um, in Thurston County, um, as I mentioned, we're interested in life expectancy and how long, um, how long you live and, of course, the quality of life. And currently, if you were born today, you'd live to be 80 is what our current life expectancy live is. Live to be what? 80. Oh, good. And, um, <laughs> and um, for Thurston County, one of the good things that I can say is in general, we tend to beat the stats of other places. People here live a year or two or more longer than other places. Yes. That, that's 
Yes, and we want that to continue, <laughs> but we would like to continue that equitably. And you can see the other chart I wanted to show you, just if you take a look and you look at folks by gender, by race, or by ethnicity, there are disparities, mm -hmm. and there's differences. And there's things that, when, you, when it comes to your community, the health of your community, how your community is designed, what your community supports, it can help narrow these gaps so that more people um, have that opportunity to live long and well. Um, I was going to share with you just, um, it's, uh, it's just facts of where things are when you look at um, the leading causes of death for folks age 65 plus in Thurston County. This is the top 10 list. And in part I wanted to mention it because um, some of the things that we do about prevention can impact this slide. Preventing initiation of tobacco use can impact diseases on here and folks won't be suffering some of those health conditions that come from this later in life. Substance use impacts all ages and we're seeing some of that impact in some of these causes of death. But also when you look at this, when you look at accidents or the six um, leading cause of death, um, most of those are falls and there's a lot that can be done around fall prevention and services that relate to that. Um, so, you know, that for some of these also things that are tried and true, um, assuring there's a methods, opportunities, regardless, to be physically active, to have um, uh, appropriate diet, nutrition opportunities, that all matters no matter what your age. Um, I pulled a few other demographics just to share with you because there's been a lot of different discussion about um, what, does, what do the folks that are age 65 plus in Thurston County look like? And what I wanted to just share with you is um, basically one in five are low income or living in poverty. And so that's a consideration. And a sizable proportion are working, as you can see by this, men and women. Veteran status, we have a lot of veterans in our county. It is um, an important yeah. component of our county. And uh, about um, one in four uh, adults age 65 plus are veterans in our county. Um, we also have some data that relates to disability, and um, I wanted to share with that, that with you because at age 65 plus, we are seeing about one in three adults have some type of disability. It, there's a range of things. It could be, it could be hearing, walking, some problems you know, with self-care, um, cognitive issues. It can be a range of things. But I wanted to pull out that other number because that's one that is a bit concerning and we want to keep our eye on, and that's being able to live independently. That's what people want to be able to do. And so that percentage gives you a feel that we're at about 14% of folks who do have, dif they're living alone, or they're living in their own home, but they have difficulty doing things on their own. There's a lot of things that can be done in terms of support and other things to make sure that we look at those kind of um, opportunities to help folks like that so something, so something doesn't happen that they can't be in their own home. Um, health status, one of the things I wanted to share with you is often we don't talk about enough, is um, really three and four folks who are age 65 plus feel they're in good or better health. And that's their outlook. And this particular statistic comes from a, a way that we survey that kind of predicts um, how you view your health, and that prediction does usually gen generally be if you feel like you're in fair, poor health, you do tend to die sooner. And so that's actually, we got a lot of folks who feel that they're in pretty good, no matter what's going on with them, they feel they're in pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good or better health. And then I pulled a few things, though, but some of them are really worried. And so some of the data that we have available for folks is looking at how many folks are worried about having enough money for food, and how many folks are worried about money for housing, and I've given you those figures. And one of the things in looking up figures for this particular presentation, I was looking at the Washington State Department of Ag, um, Agriculture does a report on one of their emergency food bank programs, basically, that they run statewide. And one of the things that they note from their most recent report is that seniors are a growing part of those who are receiving food bank services across Washington State and that they're having a harder time meeting their needs based on some of the things they're seeing, which is something we, we should consider. And to end my time, what I wanted to share with you is something that's really good. 
And that is, um, over the next few months, we have an opportunity that we're partnering with Senior Services for South Sound at, and the Health Department to produce a um, health and aging data brief to kind of put together all the data that we have for folks that, um, that similar to what I shared with you today, so it's all in one place. We've taken a look at what we know and taken a better look at what those, uh, what health figures, and things that we can do to describe the need in Thurston County. And we have a wonderful intern who I was gonna introduce to you today, Allison De Janeiro. Yeah, yeah, and she and is um, yeah. a master's in public health uh, in, a student from the University of Cincinnati who's going to be working with us over the next three years to produce this report. So. Three, three months. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. Mm -hmm. Woo. Yeah. We hope it'll be out in July. Yeah. And so three years, she so. wants to work in public health. You never know. Okay, come on. So, yeah. um, so thank you for this time. I just wanted to share that with you. You bet. Yeah. Any comments? No, but I liked your presentation because I resemble your presentation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for everything you do. I can assure you, I appreciate it very yeah, much. You got a vested interest here. Yeah. How about you? Every time I drive by a cemetery anymore, <laughs> I feel like I should be apartment hunting. <laughs> um, and uh, you've just shown me that my wife is likely to outlive me by four or five years. Yeah. That didn't give me comfort. <laughs> but it does, I don't want to be left alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're right, this is something we need to pay attention to in this county when it comes to the housing and mental health needs yeah. uh, uh, and physical and health and medical health needs of our seniors. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you know, fairly soon enough, God willing, we'll all be there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. There's and something we need to watch, because right. this is a great community to, to retire to as mm -hmm. well, and we'll mm -hmm. be attracting more and more. Mm -hmm. and so just, thank you for there's this, There's so Marianne. many prevention opportunities regardless of your age, mm -hmm. so. So, so my new number is 80, and I want to thank you very much for that number. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to try to be, and always we appreciate your uh, research and your candidness, and the numbers really tell a story that we need to know. I mean, there's an emotional and human side of this, yeah. but the numbers really do speak volumes to how we uh, live better here in this community. Yeah. And thank you, Allison, for being involved, and hope to see more of you in public health. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marianne. Thanks. So the next item we have is Chris doing another introduction to Senior Health Services. Oh, he sets that up. Here comes Eileen. How you doing, Eileen? <laughs> it's so good to see you. Me too. You bet. Thanks for letting us come. Oh, we wouldn't dare miss it. We gotta have it. So uh, this next presenter may need no introduction. Um, <laughs> Eileen Mackenzie Sullivan is from Senior Services for South Sound, and so if you like the presentation on data, you'll love the presentation that's following here, which is about the services that are available to the community uh, for the older adults in our community from this organization, um, both serving their uh, health and social and other service needs, and uh, Eileen has great grasp on that. She's been serving as the executive director for senior services for some time, and the organization's been around for mm -hmm. many decades. Yeah, so yeah. take it away, Eileen. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Nope. <laughs> oh, I can do that. Okay, yeah, great, yeah. thanks. So yes, I'm aging in place. I've been there a long time. Mm -hmm. How many years? 35 yeah, as yeah, of yeah. July wow. 1st. Three so. decades and so wow. Yeah, wow. But senior services has been here longer, oh, yeah. 44 years now. We've been trying to help improve the quality of life for people as they age. So our programs are many and diverse, and the first six up there are our direct service programs, and we'll go into each one of those just a little bit. The last bullet there are the um, support programs that actually help raise funds to provide some of those services. Our largest program is actually our senior nutrition program. We have six sites in Thurston County and two in Mason County. Um, national stats, we didn't have all of Mary Ann's wonderful stats, um, but we're really looking forward to working with her and learning more about our county. Um, but I'd like to just talk about that second to the last bullet there and just the return on investment, and this comes from Meals on Wheels of America that every dollar that is invested in a Meals on Wheels meal actually helps save $50 of Medicaid funding 
so people aren't going into nursing homes that are primarily funded by Medicaid. So I think it's a, a real good investment. Um, also, we really want to focus on the fact that people on Meals on Wheels, it's more than just a meal that people are getting. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. So senior services staff, we have actually 19 staff in the nutrition program. Three of those are kind of more the office folks or social workers. Um, Kathy, our director, is here today, and she's a registered dietitian and does a great job directing the program. Then we have 16 direct service staff and over 150 volunteers that help do everything from kitchen, working in the kitchen, to delivering those meals on wheels, um, helping to clean up. It's a great group of volunteers. We do a lot of um, involvement in the community. Kathy sits on a number of um, Thurston projects here, and we really hope to lift up the concerns of senior issues. At times, um, senior concerns, even though we're large in number, as you saw from the statistics, um, seniors can kind of be invisible. A lot of them aren't very demanding. Um, so we really just want to lift up their needs in the community. We have a lot of partnerships through our senior nutrition program, and the biggest one, a nod to all of you here at the county and the food rescue program that um, Thurston County underwent, and a big thank and shout out to the Thurston County Food Bank. Robert Coit, before he became the director of the food bank, actually worked at senior services, so he knew about the senior nutrition program and how important and how much we need access to low-cost food. Um, we've used a lot of the rescued food in actually our rural senior centers. It's been able to help us get more nutritionally dense food for folks, better variety, and it also just benefits all of us in the environment so that food isn't just wasting in the landfill. We also have a great new partnership with Grub, um, and they are helping us access more fresh fruit and vegetables for our seniors. And lastly, with Thurston County Animal um, Services and Concern for Animals, we found that a lot of our seniors were sharing their Meals on Wheels meals with their pet. You know, they're isolated <laughs> and they're lonely and their pet is very important Aww. to them. Um, so we now have a program that we deliver pet food to our low-income seniors that have a hard time affording it. We've also helped them connect with um, mobile grooming and with mobile vet care as well. So eligibility for our programs. We, people can eat for a donation if they're 60 and over at our community dining sites. Um, to get a home delivered meal, they actually need to be essentially homebound. Like it would be very difficult for them to get out for um, getting out to the doctor or that kind of thing. Um, it is not an income-based program. Anybody can be hungry and isolated, and it's for everyone. We give everybody an opportunity to donate towards the cost. Of course, our low-income seniors can't, and we try to let them know that that's okay. We want them to eat. And right now, about 35% of our um, participants are low-income. So these are the meals. We served a little 100 and 11,000 meals, that was for 2016, to about 3,000 older adults. Um, last year, 68 and a half thousand of those were to homebound seniors, and we served about 500. Um, this is our budget for the program. It's about 40% of senior services overall budget. Um, and the nice thing is that dollar amount doesn't reflect the, our in-kind um, contributions, the donated space at many spaces or the low-cost space, um, and also all of our, of course, our volunteer work and our donated food. And that money comes from a variety, about 58% total for the public dollars, 18% is what the clients donate for their meals, 16% comes from grants, which includes our CIP dollars that we receive, and then 8% is our fundraising dollars. So we receive our 
the largest majority of our public dollars from the Older Americans Act federal dollars funnel to us through the Lewis Mason Thurston Area Agency on Aging. One of the requirements that they have is that we do a client satisfaction survey annually. And um, a few of the quotes, I'm just going to read one of them. I am diabetic and I don't have enough money, so this is how I get my salad. So the reality is it is hard for some seniors to afford the high cost of good food. So these are comments from our Meals on Wheels participants, and many of them have to say <laughs> is they have more social contact because of the daily visit with the person who delivers the meals. It really is more than just a meal. Every once in a while, I get to go and um, deliver Meals on Wheels if somebody is sick or can't show up for their route. I know, I think, Bud, have you gone out on a Meals on Wheels? Not that one. Not no. yet. Oh, you on that have to one. get you out there. Mm -hmm. the but it came home to <laughs> me that some of our seniors who are in their 90s are often counting on support from their adult children who are in their 70s and facing issues of their own. And um, that was really clear to me when I brought a meal to a man who was getting meals five days a week because he was getting help on the weekends from his kids. And he asked me, is there any way I can get meals on the weekend now because my son just had a heart attack and my daughter-in-law is fighting cancer. So I was happy to be able to say, yes, we will start bringing you seven meals a week. Wow. Wow, that's great. So our goals for our nutrition program which I think is really our, our real essential program that we offer, um, is that we don't want to be in a place where we have to have waiting lists. Um, unfortunately, in 2013, with the sequester, we lost a lot of funding really quickly, and we had to do close a few days of service of community dining, and we had to start a waiting list for Meals on Wheels. And we are vowing that that is not going to happen again. We also want to work more with our hospitals who have... Um, a lot more mandates of not having people go back into the hospital after they've been released. And we believe that helping to provide their patients as they get out Meals on Wheels could help prevent that readmission. So that's something that we want to work on. So the next program is the STARS program. And that's next and because it's closest to my heart. It's what brought me to Thurston County in 1981. Our STARS is an adult day program that offers respite to family members that are caring for their loved ones at home, and it offers a great socialization program for our participants. It costs about $65 a day for somebody to bring their loved one to STARS, but the nice thing is we have scholarships, again, thanks to CIP process and also to a grant from the Area Agency on Aging and also from the State Developmental Disabilities Program. Um, it's a wonderful, when I get down in the dumps or worried about funding, I just go and spend a little time singing with the STARS clients and it brings my spirits right back up. Mm. Really the um, program that launched Senior Services 44 years ago is our Senior Center Activities Program. We now run the Olympia Senior Center and the Lacey Senior Center. And we have all kinds of health and wellness um, programs. Fall prevention, as Marianne was talking about um, seniors, the major injury is actually fall. So we have Tai Chi Quan for better balance and enhanced fitness. Um, another program, though, that I'm really proud, and again, thanks to Thurston County, we have that. And that is our inclusion program for seniors with developmental disabilities. We have a lot of seniors that have aged out of an assistant employment program with Morningside or Exceptional Foresters, um, and they didn't have anywhere to go and not much to do. And they w started coming into the Senior Center, and we didn't have a lot to offer them. So with a grant from Thurston County Developmental Disability Program, we were able to hire a part-time person that really gets activities geared to what their interest is, and surprisingly, those activities are of interest to many of our seniors. So it's called the Inclusion Program. And I just hats off to Thurston County. We are one of two senior centers in the state of Washington that have a program for folks with developmental disabilities. <coughs> Supportive services. This is kind of our safety net program. We have part-time social workers 
at both of the centers that help connect seniors to resources that they might need. We have a food bank, again, in partnership with the Thurston County Food Bank at both centers. We have support groups for people who are going blind or who are blind, caregivers, people suffering with Parkinson's disease or ALS. We also have the SHIBA program to help seniors navigate its statewide health insurance benefit um, advisors. They're trained by the Office of the Insurance Commissioner so that seniors can navigate Medicare and figure out what they're supposed to do. Um, our newest program is home sharing. We are concerned about the lack of affordable housing, especially for our seniors, many of whom are just on Social Security. And we have seniors who are living in a big home they haven't moved out of, they have empty bedrooms. How do we link up and help compatible seniors get together so a senior that's getting $800 a month Social Security can maybe live for rent for $400 and share a home with somebody. And finally, we have an intergenerational pro program called STEP, Sharing Teens and Elders Program, where we get teenagers together with seniors and it's beneficial for both. One of our long-term programs is the Care Connection. Many seniors need help in their homes. We offer a caregiver registry so that we check out the caregiver and then recommend them to the seniors who hire them directly. We also help with housekeeping, yard work, and handyman so that seniors aren't hiring somebody that might rip them off. That is really, really challenging. And a program that I'm very proud of, again, you'll probably remember back to the first Tim Iman initiative that really affected our transit program in Thurston County when they had to pull into the city core and cut off transportation to Tenino and Bucota and Yelm and Steamboat Island. Um, we were able to get a small grant from the, trans from the tran Department of Transportation and purchase two vans. We have a crew of volunteers that go out and pick people up where the bus doesn't go and bring them in to medical appointments and to the meal program and STARS. And we also take people who are in the service area for inner city transit out to the VA and out to specialists in Tacoma and in Seattle who otherwise wouldn't be able to get there. Again, that is helped and supported by the Older American Act dollars in part and then through client donations. So back to our enterprises. So we, you know, as you probably know, public dollars stay pretty flat, but with the growing demographics and the growing needs, we've had to get creative on how to fund services. And one of the ways we have done that is through running a trips and tours program, where we have day trips and overnight trips run by volunteers. Um, we Anything that we profit from that comes back and supports our programs for our low-income seniors. We also have two resale stores that help that, one at the Olympia Senior Center and one the estate store on Columbia Street. And that helps us raise those dollars for seniors. We couldn't do it without our volunteers program wide. We have over 500 volunteers. Um, it is amazing. If we take all of the hours of those volunteers, we would have to increase our staff by another 30% to make up for the work that those volunteers do. And agency-wide, the funding pro pro profile is a little bit different. Um, about 35% of Older Americans Act and USDA dollars and 5% of other public dollars. So 40% is publicly funded, 30% is generated by donations and fees that the seniors themselves pay, and 30% is by fundraisers and donations and grants. And I would be remiss, oh, I have to also say that, again, doesn't include the in-kind donations of food, volunteer support, and space. And I would be remiss if you haven't been invited by one of our awesome table captains. Our Brighton Lives Luncheon is this coming Tuesday on the 16th from noon to 1. And I know Tuesdays are a busy day for you guys, but you have to eat. So you're welcome. If you're not already <laughs> sitting at somebody else's table, you're welcome to come sit at my table. Just let me know. What was the name of it again? Our Brighton Lives Lunch. Oh, Brighton Lives. Yeah, the okay. RL. Yeah, right. We do have to eat. 
That's on the 16th. <laughs> okay. And they can't have a meeting without us. That's All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Do you have any comments for Eileen? Thank you so much, Eileen, for everything mm -hmm. that you do. Because mm -hmm. I tell you, I, I've, I've worked with you over the years, a lot of years. Yep. I, I don't. I won't even comment how many. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, the last time I saw you, you were helping out at a Yelm Senior Center fundraiser, pouring coffee at a restaurant in Yelm that was having a pancake Probably. feed. Actually, for I was seniors. down. Uh, I think Hutch and I have both been down serving down That's there. That's right. At, uh, and you, I wasn't Center, there the so, day that you yeah. gentlemen were so, there. But and I would like you. to report that it was very good food because I ha I got to eat with the seniors while I was there. Because I'm old enough to participate, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was super good. Thank you. Excellent. So thank thanks. Kathy. She's the dietitian. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm. And last month, I was able to go down. I was invited, and I went down to serve lunches uh, and with the disabled, uh, uh, developmentally disabled folks, and it was fun, uh -huh. engaging, and compassionate. It was a, it was a laugh, but it was a lot of fun. I was able to reconnect with a lot of people I've known over 30 years downtown Olympia. Heard that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Donna and I look was forward still talking about it when I got there the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to doing that again. Good, um, you. And you're paying attention. I love you. Pay attention, and you do what you do with compassion, Eileen. Thank you. Oh, Just thank one you. real quick question: the the rural transit that you that you provide. Mm -hmm. How many trips do you make a month or a week when you're helping people get get into town? Um, boy. So the rural transit, that is the tribal and the rural transportation isn't what we're in charge of. Right, just but, what you do. But though. we do transportation. Some of it is in our volunteers' own vehicles, and some of it we own now seven vehicles, two wheelchair accessible vehicles. We have a crew of about 15 volunteers and a part-time paid coordinator. And I know his mileage is really, really up right now, and I'm thinking he's pushing 500 miles a month that he's wow. doing right now. Um, so I don't know on the top that's of my head fine. how many trips, but I can get that But it's, crit no, that's, it's critically important work, and thank you for doing yeah. that, providing that service. a lot thank of you. isolated people out there. Yeah, Eileen, I know you've been told it a thousand times, but y the uh, senior, South, senior Services of South Sound is absolutely a critical asset and brings so much value to our community. I can, just the thought of it not being around really is uh, just scary. So we thank you for being there. And I just got to ask you, what is on the blue button? Oh, oh it yeah. says <laughs> Meals on Wheels so no oh. sen senior goes hungry. OK, so I owe you a trip for Meals on Wheels. and That's we'll right. That. OK, I'm on camera it. saying it, so we're good. Great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all you so much for what you do for our elders. You bet. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. All righty. So we went from breastfeeding to mental health to some of the community stuff and now we get to talk about the fun stuff for food inspection results so we're going to ask Sammy Berg from the environmental health of um, public health and social services to give us a I think you have an update on your website right yes yeah we want to see it make sure our hamburgers are good and french fries are good and yeah. carrots carrots think carrots right <laughs> hmm. So basically, there's been a long time uh, public request for more access to restaurant inspections. We've had a long time uh, relationship with the Olympia newspaper, and they'd been a, a good reporter of our, our inspection results. Um, but uh, one of the problems was that they, they'd always have a space limitation on the amount of page that they could fill up with our inspections, and then also just some delay sometimes with, with putting that out. And so we've been finally able to get um, our own reporting web page uh, and so now that uh, that's available people can go through either one of two ways one they can look up a restaurant or a food establishment by name and address so like a 7-eleven on pacific avenue sure. or they can look at the inspections that have been done most recently for the last 90 days um, because we've, we've seen that people tend to have one of two things they want to like look at well i want to go to x restaurant tonight what's a restaurant inspection that I like. But there's also, uh, they like to just see what what's randomly out there. Um, and, and either like, I, I wanna go to that place or I don't wanna go to that place. And uh, either way is a good information from us to the public. And so uh, we have those two options for them to, uh, to use. Um, and then we also have some explanations of um, kind of the the jargon we try not to use, but there's in there somewhere, but also an explanation of the red points and the blue points. 
And just as a reminder, the, the red points are violations that are more directly related to food safety concerns, uh, not washing your hands. Uh, and then the blue points are more like cleanliness issues or just kind of general maintenance pieces. Um, and basically what, what you can't see right now, but <laughs> if you could, um, could basically work. is um, the, the name of the there establishment. Go. Oh, good. Okay. Well, yeah, so here's a screenshot. Um, so tell basically. Us, tell us what we're looking at. Um, what, you, what you would see at the top of the screen would be uh, the name of the establishment, uh, Joe's Pizza. Um, uh, in this case, this is, they have a, a number of inspections. Uh, this is more like a, a grocery store where they have uh, a deli, a bakery, and then the grocery store. And then each piece gets its own inspection. And you'll see when it was last done, the number of red and blue and total points. Um, what kind of violations there were, like in the bottom one, it talks about proper cold holding temperatures, and then the inspection notes. And sometimes they're just, if there's no problems found, you'll see that they are basically the, the temperatures and the items that we, we measured. Um, if there are issues, then um, you'll see, like number 21, the bag salad greens were too warm, and then below that will be, a, here's how we corrected that problem uh, before moving on. And are we still, yeah. Um, but basically, that's a lot of what, what you would see. Um, it, the intent is to try to give folks the access to our last inspection that we, were, uh, we had done out there. This is seen as version one. And it, it is admittedly uh, kind of uh, quick and dirty kind of as far as how we put it together and the development of it, but we definitely wanted to err on giving people the information directly uh, and not wait for something perfect. And so we are looking for version two, not too much longer down the road, maybe another year or two. Part of that is we want to, um, we're looking at what Public Health Seattle King County is doing with their uh, emoticon grading of restaurants. Yeah, happy face, smiley face. Oh um, <laughs> Little heart and all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> hopefully not the, uh, the you know, the, the emoticon with the you know, oh, okay, skew that. coming out. No, no, we don't. Um, <laughs> but um, but <laughs> the they're, crying one, huh? they're, they've done a lot of good work, and, and that's part of uh, a, a, bigger, a, bigger, um, a bigger department, more resources, but also in partnership with the University of Washington. And so they're, they're creating basically a, an effective way to, to pretty quickly communicate, is this a good place to eat or bad place to eat from a food safety perspective? Um, and we want to kind of follow along those lines uh, and give people a, a more in-depth information if they want it. And so in the future, you'll have the option to see, you know, what the kind of the, the emoticon is. You can see a summary, or you can go all the way into the nitty-gritty depending on what you're, you know, what you're looking for. Down to the um, and so that will be in the future. Um, we also are looking to see how we could promote not just all the inspection scores, but also those that are doing really well, mm -hmm. you know, like a Golden Fork Award or something like oh, that Golden to Fork. just really promote mm -hmm. folks that are uh, consistently uh, excellent in, in how they do their food safety things um, and, and provide more information along those lines. But this is now available. The public can get to it. So um, just to uh, recap, just sure. to tell what the website uh, name is and then and walk Sure. Um, and unfortunately, it's a website address, but it's... Um, www.co.thurston.wa.us, yeah. so that's just the county website, yeah. slash health, mm -hmm. slash EH food, slash FS inspections dot ASP. So or Google inspections or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, but basically yeah. if you say, yeah, yeah. Thurston, <laughs> Thurston inspections under Google or other search yeah. engine, this will likely be one of the top few that come that's up. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Um, and hopefully the public finds it easy, and we are... Uh, definitely interested in their um, their comments back and wh how we can make it better. And sure. I look forward to hearing that. You bet. Um, <clears throat> we did want to, uh, I guess that's, I hit all the points that I want to. Uh, any sure. questions? Comments, questions? No. Nope. Thank you. Thanks for keeping our food safe. I'm going to go try it out this evening and see how you did. <laughs> okay. We, we, we definitely appreciate the, uh, the, the public's continued interest in these and uh, we know, and so the restaurant owners know, that the public does pay a lot of attention to it. They want good food, but they also want it to be safe. So oh, yeah. this will be another tool for the folks to use. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. It's oh, easy oh, to use because while you were talking, I looked up a couple places I had oh, okay. eaten at in the last week and, uh, and tonight for a club meeting, and I feel very comfortable. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Are you ever going to get to an app? Um, I'm that may be part two. Well, okay. If certainly else, if nothing else, we end up with something that's uh, – more mobile friendly. Sure, sure. Um, that'll be part yeah. of that phase two development. That way I'm in route, I can see what I'm doing. Yes, the other side driving. of that is no, um, not driving, not, not while driving, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. mm -hmm. um, as we look at uh, whether or not we actually want to have restaurants post their scores outside mm. their restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And as part of that, um, you know, folks have used uh, quick links that can then use an app and quickly get you to their last inspection scores. So while you're looking at their menus and their prices, you could also look at their food safety. A yeah, number yeah. of things they were looking at to try <coughs> to do that. Yeah. That's right. I don't like onions, so we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sammy. You bet. Okay. Let's see what we got next here. So we're going to move right into the director support for director for public health and social services, Shelly, and then we're moving to Dr. Woods. Thank you. Um, I have just a few brief announcements to share with you and our audience before Dr. Wood and I update mm -hmm. you on an important emerging public health concern. But starting with um, some good news, um, in addition to being Mental Health Awareness Month and National Nurses Month, uh, it is also Better Hearing Month. And we know that one in five adults in our community suffer from hearing loss and that seniors are adversely uh, impacted by that. So I wanted to be sure to mention that to you today, and we would like to honor and bring awareness to this important public health matter. So this will be on your agenda at the Board of County Commissioners next week. Uh, I would also like to share with you some exciting things we've done this month with kids. And uh, Chris Hawkins, uh, he shared with me that uh, the, Chris, what can you share with the name of the uh, school's program? Yes, the um, Safe Thurston County Safe Kids was a recipient of a grant to do bicycle helmet uh, delivery to all elementary schools and middle schools around Thurston County, and we've been working with them and Intercity Transit to distribute those helmets over the last month. So far, we've reached 12 schools, uh, and there are plans to get to the remaining, what is that, 38 or more schools around the county uh, within the next couple of months so that kids will have those helmets on their heads for summer bicycling, and uh, so it's going to go to some kids who really need that kind of help and uh, keeping themselves safe out, out there on their wheels. And help prevent traumatic brain injury and they fall down. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks, Chris. You're so for all the kids that are staying up late watching TCTV, listen <laughs> to your parents, <laughs> wear your bike helmets. <laughs> and we provide some <laughs> appropriate <laughs> helmet fit information with that and a brief kind of tutorial to the staff at the schools who are helping to distribute those helmets so that they, they can help the kids and families get, get those helmets on the heads in a way that, are, that will be effective. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so we also uh, recently received a grant um, called the Elbe Inlet Septic System Education Project. So we recently received this from the Department of Health and are very excited about this opportunity that will be an education program in Elbe Inlet, um, which, as you know, is a high-priority watershed with commercial shellfish harvesting areas. Uh, this grant is going to start in July, so you'll get to hear more about it, but um, we're very excited that this will give us an opportunity to provide enhanced educational opportunities, including the opportunity for residents to take a self-inspection certification class or workshop and provide incentives to report inspection results to the health department and provide uh, more opportunities for community feedback um, um, as a result of our on-site uh, septic system, sewer system inspection plan. So I just wanted to share that. And now, um, can someone set up the slides for the Summit Lake report? Chris, could you do that? And while he's doing that, I'm going to embarrass you just for a second and congratulate you on making the front cover of The Voice, the Thurston County Chamber's monthly magazine. And I encourage everyone to go there and read Shelley's thoughts on health in the community here and where she's going to take this community in the future. She's made a difference in uh, this community and other uh, organizations and we're so happy to have her on board here as a director here at Public Health and Social Services. Thank yep. you so yep. much. Cover girl. Okay. 
So um, we'd like to share an, an emerging public health concern out at Summit Lake. So um, Summit Lake is a popular recreational lake uh, with over 470 homes surrounding it in western Thurston County. Um, it's also where a popular Boy Scout camp is and many re residents in our community enjoy that lake. Uh, this uh, last week on Thursday, uh, we tested the lake after reports of an algae bloom. And the lab results were returned yesterday afternoon and we learned that there is indeed a toxic algae bloom and that that algae is releasing anatoxin A, which is a potent neurotoxin. There are acute health dangers associated with this toxin, including death, so it is an issue that we are taking very seriously. The amount of anatoxin A present was measured at over 350 micrograms per liter. Thank you. They're trying to help me out with the mic here. Mm -hmm. So the, um, as I was saying, um, the levels are 350 micrograms per liter. The Washington State Department of Health guidelines establish one um, per liter as a level of public health concern. So this is very significant. Uh, Summit Lake is a drinking water lake, so most of the residents do get their drinking water from the lake. So we wanted to take this opportunity, um, in addition to our other efforts, to inform the residents of that community and those that use the lake of this um, important concern. And Dr. Wood is going to share um, what kind of precautions people should take uh, regarding the lake. Great. Dr. Wood. Apparently my mic is on. Is that working? Okay. She's... I didn't have to. Okay. So first thing. Okay. We can hear you. So yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the recommendations to residents include don't drink the water taken from the lake until laboratory tests show the water is safe. Um, Is your mic bad? Conflicting information. There you go. So please don't drink the water from the lake until laboratory tests show that the water is safe. Uh, uh, water treatment systems do not remove or deactivate the algae toxin. Don't shower in the water from the lake. Don't wash dishes or do laundry in water from the lake. And do not fish, swim, or wade in the lake. Um, and keep pets and livestock away from the lake. Um, uh, it don't let them drink the water. So those are our main um, recommendations. We'd like to say that... Um, be certain the water is safe for drinking and other uses, and to be certain that it's going to take some time. We anticipate um, that uh, you need to follow these directions for at least the next two weeks. And we're monitoring the situation, and further samples will be taken. Um, actually, uh, we're being taken today, uh, though they include uh, some from, from taps of homes um, and also from uh, sites around the lake and um, what we don't know is if the toxin is still present if it is present we don't know how long it will be present and we do not know yet if there are additional algae toxins uh, present at levels of concern uh, what we have done is we're t as I said we're taking the samples today signs have been posted at the lake the public docks and clubhouse and email has gone out to the Lake Association listserv, a news release has gone out. Uh, the news release is posted on Public Health's Facebook page, Twitter account, and uh, uh, there is an article in the Olympian, which is posted on the Summit Lake Community Association Facebook page, and we have sent news releases to the Griffin School District, Olympian Can you push School the button District. Again? Could you get a hold of that? Oh, Oops, I slipped off. I apologize. Um, thank you. Um, so to repeat myself, um, a news release has gone out, and the news release is posted on the Public Health Facebook page and the Twitter account. And the article, it, there is one in the Olympian, and it is posted on the Summit Lake Community Association Facebook page. And we have sent news releases to the Griffin School District, the Olympia School District, and the Griffin Fire Headquarters. Uh, we have also stood up our incident management team in response to this incident. 
We are continuing to take the samples at the lake and from the residential taps. We are setting up an informational hotline to address and direct questions. We are investigating and pursuing options for the delivery of potable water to residents. We are investigating options for resources for residents to shower. We are beginning the process of setting up a community meeting for residents and we are sending out uh, what we call a CD alert, which in this case stands for communicable disease alert to notify providers and veterinarians of the issue. Okay, great. Did you have a question or comment? Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, I have one, yeah. okay. mm -hmm. Is this any different than the other lakes around Thurston County that in the summertime occasionally come up with an algae bloom where they post to keep your animals away and don't drink the water? Is it the same type of a bacteria? Or uh, I'm, I'm wondering how that all comes We're, about. Yes, so the bacteria are called cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Okay. And there are various um, types of toxins that can be produced. Uh, the one that is uh, of concern in this instance is called anatoxin A, but there is also, um, on other occasions, um, a toxin called microcystin. Uh, we, at that at this point, we don't know about that. That result is pending, um, but it is being looked uh, into. And w what might be causing this? I, I was out to Summit Lake today, and where I went, uh, I went in the shallow part of the lake, in the, I guess that'd be the west end, no, the east end of the lake, and uh, there's a lot of goose manure over all the docks out there. And is that, do they ever do DNA testing on uh, the fe fecal chloroform, that type of thing, to, to know what the source of this type? Uh, is it possibly uh, too much fertilizer? Is it septic? I mean, what, it, the, the, what's the breakdown? The, these uh, blue-green algae uh, occur in what are called blooms. So mm -hmm. the lake will look like pea soup or it'll look like somebody poured turquoise paint on the water. and uh, that can be determined, um, is affected by nutrients, how much the water mixes up. It's also affected by temperatures, by rainfall. Um, and uh, goose poop is another issue with E. coli and fecal coliform. Um, but the, these bacteria, um, they, they go and they come, and I'm not sure that there's an exact association <coughs> with uh, goose poop. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Hutchins has a couple questions. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm real concerned about this uh, because the, the, the uh, Summit Lake area is full of families. I don't know if any of them suffered or are still suffering any power outage from the storm. So there's a lot of technological information going out and community meetings, but are we any plan for going door to door to contact residents? Because you mentioned it could be deadly. Are we doing door-to-door -door notifications to let people know? I think I saw something in emails, but I was preparing other information, so I don't have the answer for you right this second. And with kids and animals and cooking and such, uh, are there plans to get water to these people? Yes, we're, um, we're going to be um, meeting with you directly after this meeting to discuss plans. Um, uh, plans to um, provide support for the residents impacted by this. And also we do have plans to hold a community meeting in person and are providing multiple ways of notifying notifying the public out there. I'll wait till the, the briefing then afterwards because this, this isn't going to be aired for some time, this meeting. Uh, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm real concerned. Thank you. Any other thoughts on Summit Lake or any other items? No? Romero? No? All righty. That brings us to the end of our um, BO Board of Health today. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, oh, oh, nope. Oh, oh. Mm. We're going to adjourn. Nope, we're going to adjourn. Huh. Is there a motion to adjourn? Okay, then, uh, Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn the Board of Health meeting of May 9, 2017. <laughs> Second. It's been moved and second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Okay, we are adjourned.
Thank you.